Staying Alive UK. Share your story. Hi, Sean. Welcome to the Share Your Story podcast. How are you today? I'm great. Thanks, Michael. How are you doing? Yeah, really well, thank you. Uh, where I am in the Midlands, it's pouring with rain. What about the sunny south coast of the UK? Yeah, it's, it's not so sunny today. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's pouring with rain here as well today. Okay. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, we're in the midst of winter, more or less. So, yeah, it's it's pretty awful. <laughs> But we're used to it, so we shouldn't complain. Uh, it doesn't make it easy with all this COVID nonsense going on around us as well. So uh, but I'm, I'm really glad you're on the podcast. Thanks for coming on. I'm really looking forward to, to hearing your story. Um, but let's start at the beginning. So what I'd like you to share with the listeners is tell us a little bit about where you were born, have you moved around, where you live now, a bit about your education, uh, any other personal nuggets that we need to know. Mm -hmm. And then we'll transition into your first job, uh, your career, and then we'll get to present day with your, your current company, which is Diverso, which I'm really looking forward to digging into a bit further as well. So over to you, Sean. All right. Cool. Thank you. So yeah, I guess it's nice, nice and easy, really. I haven't moved anywhere. Um, born and bred in the in the south of England, I've been here all my, all my life. Um, right. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> um, where should I start? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, yeah, you know, I was just a normal, normal person growing up. Normal, normal lad. Uh, went to uh secondary school in you know down here as well like i said i haven't haven't moved around um right. after secondary it was it was when i was about 12 years old that's when i decided i wanted to be an accountant um, 12 12 yeah I, I didn't have a clue what one did i imagined myself counting money in a bank but the the, the reason why i made that decision is because <coughs> i i liked maths i liked numbers and i was i was relatively good at it and we were when I was younger, we weren't we weren't poor, you know. We were a wonderfully average family. We didn't go without, but yeah, I you know there was there was obviously things you want as a as a child that you don't always get. You know, you want the latest console or, or whatever. And I just I had an image of me growing up. I always wanted a BMW and you know a, a, a comfortably big house. Yeah, uh, nothing fantastic. Yeah, you know, no no ambitions to be a multimillionaire and, and have a huge mansion or anything but i no. had friends that uh, so we lived in eastley eastley is a small town sort of on the outskirts of, of southampton right and then there's a, a few different parts there's eastley which i guess you would call the working class area that's that's where i grew up that's where i live yes and then you've got charnas ford and valley park which are more affluent areas of yeah the they don't, they're, they're within the borough but they're the same thing and the secondary school I went to is a mixture between Eastleigh and people in Charles Ford and Valley Park. Right. And one of one of my best friends at school, his dad was an accountant and he was one of the people that were a bit more well off. You know, he always had the latest console and uh, latest gear and, and stuff like that. And I just looked mm. at him and thought, you know, I, I want to be like that when I'm older. That's what I want. I want to be able to provide for, for my kids. And, and yeah, I don't want them to. I don't want to say that I went through struggles because I didn't, you know, like I said, we were, we were wonderfully average, but I just thought it would be nice to have a, a bit of a better life. And his yes. dad was an accountant. So that's why I kind of thought, right. Okay. I, I want to be an accountant when I'm older. Right. So, because sorry, his, your friend's dad was an accountant. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Now. He still is now. Right. He right. Now. Yeah. 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 Um, so yeah, I made the decision then and basically just stuck with it. You know, no one, no one was going to change my mind. Um, like I said, I didn't know what an accountant did, but after secondary school, I went on to Barton Pebble College, um, played basketball. That was one of the, one of my highlights, I think, um, mm. the college. I, I love to play basketball even now, even though my knees don't work as well as they used to, <laughs> I, I still enjoy it. Um, yeah. And I studied the the three most fun subjects I could think of, which was maths, physics, and accounting. Right. <laughs> a lot of people might argue with that. Um, 
I mean, obviously, maths and accounting is is kind of a given, but physics. Yes. I, I get it, You know, I, I like science. I like figuring out how things work. Uh, yes. So physics was more of a I'm interested in this. I've got to do three A levels anyway, so let's let's do that one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and then yeah, my my plan is always. You know, I always had a plan since I was younger to not go to university. Right. Um, and instead go and get a job at a firm of accountants and and have a day release and train on the job. So that's that's what I did. I applied to university and, and got into uh, Sheffield Harlem Business School. Right. Um, but I just I really didn't like the thought of getting into a lot of debt mm. uh, and you know sharing a house with five smelly boys when I could mm-hmm. actually go and earn money whilst getting to the same place, getting to the and- same point in my in my career. Um, and it was. And back then, this was the early, early 2000s, 2005. Right. Yeah, 2000, 2006, the summer of 2006. That's, that's when I left uh, college and um, started in a small firm in Southampton, a small firm of accountants in Southampton. Right. Um, and it, it was around that time that apprenticeships for, uh, you know, less blue collar industries were really starting to become popular. You know, right. Yeah. It was it was it was as if the government wanted everyone to go to university at one point. And it was around that time that they decided, actually, you know, people don't need to go to university. They don't need to get into all of the student debt to get to where to get the career that they want to. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I, I took the option of, of being an apprentice instead. Um, Fantastic. Never earned a lot. I think my starting wage was nine and a half thousand pounds a year mm. um, when I started. But. You know the the, fir- the first time, and that was my first proper job as well. Mm. Um, I've only really had one one job, and that it, it was this one. And you know, I, I worked in the the co-op on a Saturday as team leader or whatever whilst I was at college. Yes, I had a paper round when I was younger, but you can't really call that proper employment, I don't think. <laughs> um, so yeah, so I was I was there, and to be honest, for the first eighteen months, I I should have been sacked. You know, that's uh, I, I, I totally I was useless. I didn't adjust very well to being a grown up and working in an office. I, so how old were you then? So that was that was when I was 18. OK, yeah. So, so very yeah, young still. Yeah, still very, very young. young. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I just I really lacked initiative. You know, I would I'd sit there and someone would give me something to do, a, a piece of work. I would do it and then just sit there. You know, I'd expect to be babysat and someone to come back to me and say oh have you finished that right I'll take that and and here you go so I I just sit there and sort of bum around and when when you first get introduced to accountancy it's quite scary there's so much I mean one of the first things that I thought of I thought tax was tax tax is tax and and that's about it Mm. and all of a sudden you you know I I, part of what I had to do was filing so I had all these different letters and then you start to think well hang on we've got VAT we've got PAYE we've got corporation tax What's, you know, I, I just thought you pay tax at some point and tax is tax. And I remember asking, PA way, does that stand for pay as you earn? And uh, and my, my sort of manager said, yeah, that's right. And I thought, oh, Christ, I know something. Um, <laughs> not really knowing at the time that almost everyone, everyone who has a job kind of knows what that's a basic thing. And I just highlighted how, how much I didn't know about sure. the world and how I wasn't I wasn't really prepared to go out in the big bad world just just yet. Mm. Um, but luckily, um, I don't know whether it's my my boss saw something in me, saw potential that I hadn't quite um, started to show yet, or whether he was just lazy and didn't didn't really want to take the step of, of getting rid of someone. Right. Um, I'm not entirely sure, but yeah, I, I definitely shouldn't have lasted that that first eighteen months. They they should have got rid of me I think which is right. quite interesting really I think so you were only with them for 18 months no I was with them for three years but okay the first, the first 18, 18 months, months you were like a I bummer was useless yeah yeah totally useless but then after that time things started to click into place and it, it, it was all of a sudden it was it very quick it was just suddenly oh my god I know what I'm doing now I know I know what all of this means and that's when it, it, things just went a bit my progression just went a bit crazy Um, but that's really interesting because if you think about if you'd had 
if you'd gone to university to learn the craft, mm. you know, in, in a classroom with lectures and casework or whatever you, whatever you have to do. I've never yeah. been to university. I don't know. There's not a lot of work people do at university. Well, that may be really unfair. <laughs> um, but um, I was here. They just want to go to university, have a good time and get drunk. Uh, exactly. that, was, that was part of the reason why I didn't want to go. I've, yeah. uh, I mean, now I, I don't drink. Um, I mean, you know, don't get me wrong. When I was uh, in my early 20s, I feel like I drank enough in my early 20s for the rest of my life. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't an alcoholic or anything, but just a no. normal, normal young lad in his 20s, you, you binge drink every weekend. Yeah. Um, and now it just it, it doesn't really interest me. I think no. maybe perhaps I'm too much of a control freak that, you know, when, when you drink a certain amount, it makes you lose control. And I don't I really don't like that anymore. No. Um, and other than that, I think alcohol just tastes disgusting. You know, who who likes the taste of some of the horrible ways that alcohol tastes? But why why do you want to do that to yourself? So I just I know, yeah, just I know. Drink. No, same here. I haven't I haven't drunk for about coming up to seventeen years now. <laughs> so, oh, very good. And I didn't give up because I was an alcoholic <laughs> either. <laughs> I just didn't like it anymore. Anyway, so so if you had gone to university and learned a craft, the course would have taken, I don't know, two years or three years mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. But instead, you were in on the job yeah. doing the training and the learning, but I it only took you 18 months to get grasp of it. Yeah, so I had, I had Dave release studying the AAT. So that's the Association of Accounting Technicians. And that's that's my qualification now. That's, yes. that's what allows me to, to be an accountant. Yeah. Um, so I had the first year I had day release. Um, I think it was every Tuesday I actually went to college. Yes. Um, and there's another interesting point is that the first year I actually went to you know pretty much every lesson. I sat in a classroom. But mm. the AAT is a strange qualification. It's you know, it, it's it's the starting course for most accountants. So you either go to university and you do your, your bachelor's degree in, in accountancy or, or whatever, or you go the apprenticeship route. And generally speaking, you'll do AAT. And then yes. after AAT, you can then go on to chartered. Um, but there's also a lot of other people that, that study the AAT. And I was only one of about three people in the room that was working in a firm of accountants, what I considered a a normal accountant. There was lots of other people that worked in practice, uh, in industry. So, mm. like there were some people that worked in the NHS, and they dealt with, you know, some of the the purchase ledger or, or something like that. Or, Got it. Yeah. And there, there was a lot of yeah people that I considered. Well, that's a bit of a weird job. You know, I'm I'm looking. I want to be an accountant. I want to deal yeah. with businesses. That's that's what I want to do. So it that the pace it moved was quite slow for me the first the first year because ultimately really it was just repeating what i'd just done in April, yes the yes. first year of aat so i don't i almost feel like maybe i should have skipped the first year but i went anyway and i was bored to tears most of the time i mm. it's it's you know i was I, I felt like i knew it um i felt like i i didn't belong there i should have been in a more advanced place and that made it a bit boring maybe That's that had a maybe that had an impact on my my life in the office as well but yes yes when it came to the second year um i i did the, the day release again and i think i went to two lessons and then hardly ever went i mm. just didn't go to college um that's not to say i just bunked off and pratted around i wouldn't go to college and said i'd study in my own time you know the day right. i was supposed to be at college and my boss didn't know this and I was part of me. I had a fear that one day the college was going to report back and say, you know, you know, Sean hasn't been here for like the last eight weeks. Mm. Instead, I just I, I stayed at home instead instead and studied in my own time. I felt, you know, I think that's that's the way I'm I learn is to do it myself, learn it for myself. I'm, I don't I'm not taught very well by someone telling me what to do mm. uh, or telling me how to do something. It's I'm, I'm much better getting stuck in and doing it, my, doing it myself. So, yeah, the second year in college, I, I basically only turned up when there was exams or the week before exams. If I got stuck on something and wanted to ask the teacher and they started to make a joke that, mm. you know, it's only once in a blue moon. That, oh, they, they saw, yeah. They'd look out the window whenever I was there and say, oh, is there a blue moon today? Sean's with us. 
<laughs> I, yeah, I, I pretty much bumped off the entire time when I when I should have been at college, and I was I was scared at some points that you know I'd go into work one day and my boss would be like, I've just heard from Easter College, you, you haven't been there, you know what's what's going on. I knew in my mind I was it was fine because I knew I knew everything. I passed every exam first time. You know, there was there was never an issue with me not going to college. I guess at that time I was just too afraid mm. to say to my boss that you know I, I'm not going to college. There's there's no point. Don't need to. Um, no, no. So I just carried on like like that. And yeah, it was it was around that time when things started to click into place, and I actually knew what I was doing. Yes. And that's when you know my learning curve at work just increased rapidly. Um, yeah. And that's when the ambition really started to stick in. Um, and that's when I realised that actually I, I think I could be pretty good at this. Well. I'm really curious how that realization came about. Yeah. You know, how how did that so is there something in your family where you know have you got people that work for themselves? Uh um, I, no, they they're all well, my sister now is runs her own hair salon. Right. Uh, she's younger than me, but back then um, when I was 19 or 20 or whatever it was. No, the, the only experience I'd had was my dad previously run a business. Um, oh, he was he, employed he... at the time. This was when I was very young, when I was about eight years old, so I didn't really have, I didn't even know he had a business. Right. All I, all I remember is in the summer holidays sometimes, we'd have to go to work because my mum did the payroll there as well for them. So my mum, and in, in, in invoicing and stuff. Right. So both mum and dad were at work at the same place. And I'll tell you, we had a lot of adventures, actually. It was a, it was a unit, um, and it was surrounded by, like, forest areas. So we'd get taken there, and they, uh, we'd have our bikes. So right. Other, we'd, we'd go around. Here's a really interesting fact, actually. Uh, <laughs> I, I swear to God that me and my brother invented, when, when we were around, around the turn of the millennium, it was, because I remember I was in year six at school, there was these little black bands that people used to wear, mm. and they called them shag bands. This right. was massively popular, like hugely popular at the time. <laughs> right. Uh, the idea was you'd give someone one of these bands, and if you, I mean, it was just petty school, uh, you know, school playground stuff. But if, if you snapped one of them, you'd have to shag the person that gave it to you. Right. Um, <laughs> but so at the time that we spent during the summer holidays, where mum and dad were busy, you know, with, with the business, he's a, a coach trimmer. So he used to recover the, the seats of, of big coaches and, and buses and stuff. Okay, cool. Um, he still does it now, actually. He's self-employed and he's really well known, really well known for recovering old red Routemaster buses. Wow. Um, I don't even know. Like, he's, he doesn't have a website or nothing like that. Just literally, just word of mouth. Everyone That's knows incredible. Within, within within the industry. It just goes to show how powerful word of mouth can be. If, if yeah, yeah. But yeah, so we spent the time like there. It was like an industrial estate. It was an industrial unit. So we'd ride our bikes round and round, and these little black bands used to fall off the lorries, and we used to collect them. We collect them, and then took them to school and used to give it to people. We didn't invent the concept of the whole shag band thing. Someone else did that. We just collected these bands and and gave them out to people. But I, I remember that was that was quite fond memories because there was like forest foresty area around it. Mm. It's just I guess it's the difference now between like my children and their childhood. And how it's different to ours that, you know, my 12 year old son is on his phone constantly. It's, it's glued to his face, basically. I know. I and know. We never had that when we were younger. But I feel like my generation is at the I ideal age is that we still experience what it was like to have a proper childhood. Because we just ride our, our bikes around this industrial estate. And now if my children do that, I'd be like, whoa, you know, stop. Watch out for the lorries. Be careful. I know. I know. Because we would just let loose and we used to go exploring in all this forest area and build dens. And we'd spend all day in this forest area sort of place. That um, would be really dangerous now. Yeah. Now you, you'd be like, no, you're not, you, you're not doing you, that. No, you're no. not going to play in the forest for hours. Somebody might come and get you, you know. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But I still feel like we, we've been, we were exposed to technology at a young enough age that we, we, we know it all. We know how to use a computer. Yes. We can fix our own problems if. If something goes wrong with the with the computer. yeah absolutely but we still experience the the good stuff of being let loose and run around the country yeah i know i know yeah fascinating and okay so your your dad so there, there's something in the genes then maybe a so. tiny bit 
Although I hope not, because his business failed. He uh, it started, to, <laughs> it started to grow, and uh, no, 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 we're not talking about that. But maybe the entrepreneurship part of it has has gone through, maybe at a you know subconscious level. Yeah. Um. So, so after having worked for the accountancy firm for three years, if that was yep. your first and last proper job, yep. Talk me through then what happened. Okay, so after this first sort of 18 months, two years, when things started to click into place and I, I knew what I was doing, mm. uh, I started to take on more responsibility. And I remember one of them was payroll. I used to deal with, started to deal with the payroll. Yes. All the time. Yes. And this is when I started to just, my initiative really came in. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't a very good firm I worked for, to be honest. You know, it's, it's right. not like, oh, they taught me everything. If anything, they taught me how not to do it. Right. So I kind of knew, right, this this is what I, I need to do the opposite of what they did. And then I'll have a, I'll have a pretty good time. Um, so I sort of, I just took control of the, um, of the payroll aspect. So I started yes. to build relationships with clients, and I didn't, I wasn't going to sit there and wait for anyone to tell me what to do. I just went ahead and did it. Um, yes. So I very much took control of it and and made it my own. And that was that was the the real first part of responsibility that I got. And then the next part was actually dealing with people's year end accounts. Right. I, did, I did the same thing. I just took it upon myself, like, right, I'm doing this. You know, they would turn up. I would do it straight away. I would grab it. I'd do it. And at this point, this is when I really loved working. I loved what I was doing. I was, I had to get the train because I, I didn't drive at this time. Mm. Uh, so I had to get the train from East to Southampton every day. And I'd always get the earliest one I possibly could, which was like six minutes past six in the morning. Wow. So I'd, be in, I'd be in the office by sort of like half past six, quarter to seven. So I, I was always the first in, and I I very much stay late. Yeah, you know, sometimes mm. I stay till eight o'clock. And the funny thing is, no one knew I was doing this. You know, no one noticed what I was doing. No one noticed the hours I was putting in, or or the work what I was doing. Except right. we had this sort of fees schedule. So if someone's accounts needed doing, their their records would come in. They drop off, you know, their bank statements or invoices or whatever it was, and it would go on these this shelving unit. I'd always make sure I was mm. the first one to grab it. So I'd grab it and then I'd do it and then we'd bill for it. So we'd raise an invoice on yes. this internal fee schedule and everyone would put their initials next to it. Um, so who, who did this job? Yes. And there was client managers that were supposed to do this. You know, they looked after the clients. It was their job to do this. So mm -hmm. I'd make sure what, what I was really focused on was, right, what is my salary per month and how much on this fee schedule is attributable to me? And I was doing like six to eight times what I was being paid. So right. I, and that's when the sort of ambition came in. Like I wasn't, I wasn't motivated for money. At no point did I ever ask for any, any money. What I wanted was recognition. I wanted people to look at that schedule and be like, Jesus Christ, look at what Sean is doing. Mm -hmm. We were only paying him like, was it like 1,200 pounds a month? And he's billing eight grand a month. That's mm -hmm. more than any other client manager. And he's not even a client manager yet. Yes. And I took it upon myself to be talking to clients as well and start giving them advice. I, I started, I, I, was, I was a client manager, but never, never got given the title, basically. Got it. Yeah, I understand. Um, and that's, that's how things started to develop. And then the next step was that I joined B&I, so my first networking. Yes. Um, that was at the age of 20. And I think I was the youngest there by quite, quite a way. Yeah, the, definitely. Yeah. So sort of the first time I went along, I stood there. I was, I was, I've got quite a quiet voice, the quiet mannerisms anyway. Yeah. I kind of stood up and had a piece of paper and I was, you know, sort of shaking whilst I did my, my 60 seconds. Yes. Um, but B&I taught me a lot. I got, you know, I, I made a few connections with people there that sort of took me under their wing a bit and gave me some advice. And uh, one of them said to me, you know, make sure you shout. Like if, if you shout whilst you're, doing your 60 seconds standing up in front of people and talking then you're probably going to be okay so I, I kind of started to shout and that <laughs> helped me develop my my voice so that it was louder so I could command a, a room of people and so B and I I was in it for six months before I decided to leave um, under my old firm and within that right. time I, I brought in about 15 new clients myself. through B and I just, just through B and I yeah wow and B&I was like, it was like a school for me, you know, a school of this, this just to improve your selling skills. This, yes. This, this is how you talk to people. This is how you talk to new clients. And that, that really, really helped. Yeah. Um, so that brings us to sort of the, my three year mark. So I've, I've been you. at the firm for three years now. 
I feel like I'm in a pretty good spot. I was still only a, an account senior. That was my job title. Yes. But I was behaving and acting like a client manager. Yeah, yeah. So it, it came up for my six monthly appraisal thing that, that I had. Mm. And I kind of went in there and said, right, I'm qualified with the AAT. I've got, you know, like 15, a, a good few clients that I would consider that they are my clients. They've only had the relationship with me. They don't know anyone else here. I've mm. brought them in. Mm. Um, and what I want is I don't want to pay rise, but instead I want to have a day, a day's, day off a week studying so that I can study for my chartered exams. And the four days I'll work 10 hour days because I'm doing that anyway. Mm. And I want to be a client manager. I want the title that comes with it. And I want to be a BNI assistant director. So I want to set up my own group and basically expand what I'm doing with BNI so that I can bring more, more clients in. Mm-hmm. And, but, and just before, it was about three months before this, we had one of those personality things that, that you do where yes. it was like a team, team building thing. So we all yeah. identified what is important to each person. And most people there, they're all sort of, you know, they they appreciate safety. They want to know that they're going to get a paycheck of a certain amount at the end of the month. And, and mm. that's it. And I was highlighted as what was called the, the star. You know, I'm not motivated by money. I was motivated by ambition and status. And you know, yes. things like having a big desk were important to me. Yes. Um, and having my, uh, you know, my name on a door or, you know, and, and a, jo- a job title and things like that. Yes. So I kind of I told him what I wanted, and I basically said, "Yeah, that's that's what I want. This is what I want." It's not. It wasn't even going to cost him anything. It was going to benefit him. Mm. He, he said no to everything. He said, "Well, you know, so, I, I can't. I can't possibly have some expect someone to work ten hours a day. So I'm afraid we can't do that." Um, I, you know, being an assistant director, I've heard people before have tried it, and it takes up a lot of time. It's very difficult. I don't want. I don't. I don't think it's a good idea. Mm-hmm. And in terms of the client manager, I don't think he even answered me on that, but he, he never said, yeah, we'll make you a client manager. And instead he said, here you go, here's a, a thousand pound pay rise a year. And I sort of walked out there thinking, like, Jesus, I've, you, you've just said no to everything I've bloody said. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, I've, I've, I'm, an, I'm a pretty good employee, I think. I'm doing good stuff. Yeah. I've won more clients here than anyone has in the entire bloody year. You know, why are you not? What have I done to upset? Why are you not giving me what what, I, what I'm asking for? It's not costing you. But in my head, I just thought you're you're bloody crazy. Like either you're crazy or you don't want me here anymore. So, and then a few weeks after that, so I was I was being a bit annoyed. I was starting to get a bit angry. Like you know, I wanted to start shouting. Why why is no one paying attention? To me? Yes, that's the attention seeker in me. I I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but then we had a we had an office move around, and I. Right. I liked where I was sat. I was like in a corner with my back to the corner so I could see the whole room. Yes. Um, and it was, it was a decent spot that I was in. I felt like, you know, that was, I, I enjoyed coming to work and sitting there. Mm. And they moved the office around and they put me at the front with my back to the door. Um, it, was, it was like a receptionist desk, basically. Like, right. And I just, that really annoyed me. And I was like, you know, can I ask why have I been moved here? And I got some <laughs> rubbish answer back from the the practice manager saying, oh, it's, it's to improve the ergonom- ergonomics of the office. And I said, well, when are we going to move again? Like, is, is there a certain <laughs> time frame or is it just at the whim of the um, practice manager? Mm. And he got all defensive. It was like, you know, how dare you send me a flippant uh, comment like that mm. um, and try to explain it. But it's basically just, you know, there's, there, there's no rhyme or reason for it. There's no consultation or involving people with the move, just kind of going, this just, is what They people... just did it. Yeah, yeah. and I, I remember, I think they did it over a weekend. Um, and I came in on a Monday and my desk had been moved by the front door. And I was like, just what what the hell, basically? And I, I didn't like it at all. Uh, no. And it was at that point I thought, you know, stuff this. Is this something that I can do myself? And yes. I thought that's when I started to work out, right, these clients I've got, um, you know, I know my contract of employee, even though they're my clients, they're my relationship, they're yeah. owned by the firm. So I, I would have to buy them. And when you buy clients in, in accountancy, it's usually like one, one to 1.2 times their annual fee. Mm. So I worked out, right, I'm going to buy it. I'll, I'll, I'm, if I, if I hand in my notice and set up my own firm, if I buy these clients, what income is that going to give me? Am I going to be okay? So I went to my dad and I, I had no money at this time. Like, no, no I'd, I'd work all, all week. 
work long hours and at the weekend I'd literally you know go out drinking and, and spunk all of my money up the wall basically um so I asked my dad for a loan so he loaned me five thousand pounds so that I could buy a desk and a computer and um buy these clients so that right. I, had, I had an income so dad said yes after some some convincing um and then I so then I was doing it you know I was right I'm gonna I'm gonna leave I'm gonna set up as um SR Tumor and Co and and away we go so I remember I, I had a week's holiday booked and I thought well this this is the time to do it so I handed in my notice I think I left on the this was like a Tuesday night so Tuesday was my last day and then I wasn't until next Monday so I stayed late the Tuesday night I packed up all my desk everything everything I ever and I wanted to take with me and I left uh, my notice yeah. on, on my boss's desk saying really? that I was, I was giving, giving my, uh, I think it was something like two uh, a month's notice I had to give or two yes. months, something like that. So this was, uh, this was like October, October 2009. Right. Um, and then the next, the next day I got a text message from my boss saying, surprised to see your, uh, um, your, your letter on my desk. Um, if we could chat when you're in next week. That'd be great. Mm. So I thought, oh, well, that's that's expected. So, yeah, the next week when I when I come back in, I went and had a chat, and and he said, yeah, really surprised to see your uh, your letter because we just had a <laughs> an appra- we just had an appraisal, and you didn't bring up any comments to say you you weren't happy. And I was I was really taken back by that. I was like, Tim, will you? Yeah. Oh, maybe I <laughs> said his name. <laughs> but I said, I said to my boss, you know, were, were you in the same appraisal as me? I asked for this, 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 and this which would only benefit the firm. And you yeah. said, no, 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 no. And I said, I, I don't want a pay rise. These are the things I want. And instead you said no and gave me a pay rise. That's what's made me unhappy. And then you um, moved my desk. And then you, yeah, I didn't actually mention the desk to him. No. I, I just, I knew he wouldn't, he'd think that that was petty and small. Even though yeah, it was sure. me, it's, it's, I think it's, you know, you've, you've got to know what, what your team want, what they, what they want out of things. And, if you can give it to them, especially if it's something that isn't, I don't think a particularly unreasonable request of you know, not having a rubbish desk to sit at and sitting in a in a nice place. Um, so yeah, he, he I think he expected he thought I was going to a different firm. He said, "So where what firm are you going to?" Mm. And I said, no, I'm actually setting up a I'm setting up by myself. Yes, I, I could see the shock in his face. He kind of thought, well, you know that's yeah that's going to work out for you isn't it because I, I was only 21 only just qualified um you know a lot of people would have said that i was not ready for it and they, they you know they might have been right but as far as i was concerned i was extremely ambitious um i was young i had no no mortgage no kids nothing like that mm. so I, I could afford to have no money i could afford to fail tremendously and it wouldn't matter i'd just go and get another job that's right yeah you know, there was plenty of jobs out there at the time. Although this was, you know, just after the the, uh, the 2008 uh, financial crash. But yeah, if anything, that helped me because that just yeah. I think that at times like that, especially looking for an accountant. This is something that we're experiencing now um, with COVID and stuff. There's a lot of account, a lot of small business owners out there that they're, they're looking at their accountant and they're not getting what they want. Mm-hmm. Whereas before, they might have thought oh, well, you know, all accountants are the same anyway. Now, actually, now they really want value for money, so they, they start looking around. Yes, yes. Yeah, so I, I handed in my notice, um, and I mapped out a plan with Tim. I said, look, I want to buy these clients and take them with me. And he said, yes, he, he agreed. So I thought, this is great. And then I fully expected him to tell me to leave and that I, I wouldn't need to work my notice. Yes. So I thought, from his point of view, it's just dangerous. If I'm still talking to clients, um. It's, it's dangerous to have me there because I could be eyeing them up to, to take them with me or definitely might, I, I might tell them I'm actually leaving the end of this month. Yes. But he didn't. He really, he really undervalued me. I, and, and he just wanted me to carry on and, and keep doing work. So you mm. know, I had no motivation to be there at all. I wanted to be out in the big bad world running my own, my own firm and get of going. Course. Yeah. Um, but now he wanted me to eat. He, he expected me to carry on. So I sat there for, out of the month's notice that I had to work, I think I was there for two weeks. Right. And, and I did absolutely nothing. Like I did no work, pretty much. I did the absolute minimum I needed to do because I just, I didn't see the point. I had no, no interest being there. Anything yeah. I did, I felt, was 
either detrimental to me or detrimental to, to the firm I was working at anyway. Yes. Um, and then after two weeks, I just, I got really annoyed. There was, there was such an atmosphere. It was, it was horrible. People knew that I was leaving. No one wanted to talk to me. Because um, there was about 12 people there. And I just, I felt like a leper in the corner. Mm. Um, and I was still going to B&I. I was still doing those things. But yes, again, that became really strange because I wasn't allowed to talk about my firm, SR2, and co, what he was doing. I had no. to be there as, as, um, as a firm that I was, I was That working. you were working for, yeah. Yeah, so after two weeks, I just got too, too frustrated and just walked out. So one, one day at the end of work, I, I decided, you know what, I'm not coming back. I, I have my own office now. I've got a, a tiny office in a big office block in um, you know, a, a tiny square room that could just about fit a guest in um, in Eastleigh. And I started going there every day and started deciding, right, let's, let's put plans in place. Let's start marketing. Let's, let's start bringing in some new clients. Right. And it didn't, didn't go back. And no, no one even contacted me. My boss didn't even drop me a text and say, you know, where are you? Are you alive? Why are you not here? Um, so I did that for about a week, and then I decided, right, I need to, I need to go back and tell them, like, you know, I'm not, I'm not coming back. You can keep my notice pay, you know, stuff here. And part of the reason why I did this as well is because my boss wrote to my clients that I was taking with me, and I'd already, I'd already had a conversation with them. I'd already said, you know, I'm going to be buying you, um, so you're going to remain clients of, of, of mine. Yes, with my old firm, and they they were perfectly happy with that. They they understood, but he decided to write to them, and and he sent them a bill. So he basically said, "It's it's always strange when a a small client decides to leave a Hampshire firm of chartered accountants um, without us actually doing any work." So you know, I've looked through what we've done on a time basis, and and here's your bill. So not only would I have to buy the client, but I'd have to pay this bill as well. And this bill that he sent, it was for, for things that you can't charge for, like. The, the initial admin when you take on a client, the engagement letters and money laundering, like you, you can never charge for that. You just, you, you can't. It's something that you have to suck up. So all these clients that contact me saying, I've got this bill from your old firm. What do I do with it? And I was like, and it, and it just threw me. And I kind of thought, well, what, you know, Jesus, why have you done this? So I realized, well, I realized what he was doing. He basically thought, now nah, I'm not selling them to you. They can stay here. You know, either they pay that bill and go to you or, um, they're going to not pay the bill and they're going to stay. Unbelievable. So, yeah, I just thought that was that was really snaky. So, and it meant that I couldn't afford to buy them. You know, things were really tight as it is. I had, had no money. I couldn't afford to buy them. No. So I decided to go in there with a, a weeks after my notice period, and I, I basically, I, uh, you know, I professionally told him to f off. Um, and it was yes. it was strange as well. You know, I walked into his office, and again, he, he didn't. Uh, he didn't respect me at all. I stood outside his office and he walked in and out of his office about three times before he said, can I help you? Um, so I ended up going in there and he tried to sort of like over, over, talk over me. And I just remember this moment. That I said, no, 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 let me finish. And then basically told him everything I wanted to say and said, I'm not coming back. Um, you can keep the clients because you've made, you, you know, you, you, you've done not, a, you've done a bad move. I, I now can't, buy, I, can, I now can't take them. You can yes. keep them. Bit. You can keep your no, my notice pay. I don't expect you to pay them. Now I'm I'm leaving. I'm leaving now. Um, and I remember walking out of his office, and I remember like it was down London Road in Southampton, which is like quite a, a businessy type place. The buildings are quite nice. It's a it's a very sort of business orientated place to be, and that's why I yes. love working there. But I remember just looking up at the sky, thinking like it, it was one of those moments that you're always going to remember. Of course, like a, a weight had been lifted, or so I just felt. I felt invincible, absolutely invincible. I was like, yes. right, come on, let's, 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 you know, I'm in control of my own destiny now. Let's, let's go. Yes. Brilliant. That's, that's brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and then you had to find clients. I did. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, it didn't go as well as I first thought, which I think every business that starts, they, they do the same thing. They kind of think, oh yeah, you know, I'll, I'll get a, a client from here and, you know, month two, I'll probably have three clients and month four, I'll have five. But it never works like that. They, they just come from very strange places. And it's always a lot worse than what you think your worst case scenario is. Always a lot worse. And that's what happened with me. Um, I, I had two or three clients already. 
yes that had approached me and i basically and i basically said that you know i'm no i can't i can't take on any clients at the moment they come back to me in a month yeah because whilst i was tra- transitioning from my old firm to to me starting by myself okay and and then luckily i had clients that were with tim lines and co and they have my mobile number yes and i you know my contract and employment said i couldn't go out and approach any clients that or potential clients um of the previous firm so luckily a couple of them phoned me on my mobile and i i had a chat with a lawyer that i knew from from bni and said if they phone me can i tell them like is that fine and they said yeah absolutely fine you, you, that that's perfectly you know your if they come to you there's there's no issue no, no, that's right. Your contract employment. So they phoned me and they were like, what's going on? I can't get hold of anyone at the office. And I was like, well, that's probably because I've left. Um, you know, I'm now running my own firm. And they're kind of like, oh, well, do I have to stay with them or can I come with you? I was like, well, because you phoned me, you can come with me. So let's 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 do it. So I picked up a, a couple of clients like that. Right. Um, but then there was this this period of about the first four or five months. It was really quiet, really quiet. And I took on hardly any clients. and. But when I, when I was with the previous firm, I had to portray a certain image, you know, very sort of prim and uh, professional. Um, mm, mm. And I wasn't really like that. So I was, when I first started, you even the name, SR Toomer & Co., I copied that from every other firm out there. It's always named after the guy that's running it or two yes. partners or every accountancy firm's named like that. Mm. Um, and I, I was, I, I'd wear a full suit and tie all the time. I would... I was desperate. I, you know, in my head, I was thinking, okay, I've got certain weaknesses. I've only got three years' experience. I'm 21 years old, and I look like I'm about 15. Um, you know, I, I need to do all these things to stop people from thinking that. Yes. And then I, I slowly started to pick up a couple of clients that they were in B&I, and they knew me, so they just thought, yeah, let's let's go with Sean. And yeah. I, was, I remember having a, a meeting with one of with, with two guys from B&I. One was a client, and one was thinking about it. Mm-hmm. And the one that was a client said, "See, the reason why I went with Sean is because he's young, he's ambitious, he's totally not like any accountant that that you've ever met before." And I'm really hoping that some of that's going to wear off on me. You know, the yes. service he's going to give is is, is going to be aligned with that. And it was after that that I thought, you know, I look at this mistake that I've been making. I'm pretending to be, I'm trying to be like every other accountant out there. Why would you do that? You know, you, mm. you have to. Do, you've got to be different and i already am different and i'm just trying to cover that up of so course. I, kind of, I, I just stopped and i was like right let's just be myself so yes. it, it slowly evolved over the next few years that i dropped the anco so it was just sr tumor which i think sounded a bit a bit more professional a bit a bit better it didn't sound so traditional yes and you know the tie went and then the jacket went so i was just wearing shirt and trousers at the time yes sort of bringing it bringing it uh bringing the industry into disrespute every every ever, ever so slightly um but just my mannerisms the way i spoke the way i addressed people i used to send an email saying dear michael um and now it would be something like hey mike or hi mate how's it going yes because the the business i was only ever interested in dealing with with small businesses and i think that's that's something that almost every other accountancy firm out there they start they take the small businesses you know i'm yes. talking typically but our, our ideal client is we, we put real personification in it and we refer to him as this guy called adam he's a plasterer he's got sixty thousand pound turnover a year no interest in getting employees and growing the business with that he's he's able to support his wife um who's doing a part-time degree at the moment he's got four kids he can even splash out a bit. He has a couple of holidays abroad a year. He's got a hot tub in the garden. That Adam is our ideal client. Someone, someone like a very small business. Um, so I started behaving in a way that these small businesses they want me to behave. Well, you know, can I just interject there? Your language is totally different from any accountant I've ever met in my whole life. Because what you just summed up in terms of Adam the plasterer, Mm. you didn't just stop at Adam the plasterer. Mm. You continued to describe his life, his family, his personal life, what he's interested in doing in his personal time. Mm. You kind of get under the skin of, you know, you know, the persona, the avatar of the individual. 
yeah. and what they're into. And so it, it's, just, it's just a totally different concept, isn't it? Exactly. Yeah. And I, I think most accountants, they want to they wanna chase the bigger clients. So poor old Adam, he'll either be ripped off and or ignored. Yes. I mean, the, his, his price will go up because his accountant won't really want to deal with him anyway. So mm. they, th- they, they, and it's not necessarily their fault. They don't want to say to Adam, look, we don't want to deal with you anymore. We're, our ideal client is someone totally different. So we think you yes. can elsewhere because they still want to help Adam. They feel like that would be letting him down. So yeah. instead, I'll just bump up the price and think, well, let's increase the price so we get a bit more profit out of it. Because they're chasing the 20 million turnover businesses where they can charge 10,000 10, pounds a year. Yes. Um, so, yeah, I've, I've always wanted to deal with the small ones because I, I like Adam anyway. I like him a lot more than dealing with a, a board or a board of directors or anything like that. Um, yes. And yes, yeah, like you say, it's Adam will be intimidated by a typical, you know, grey suit brigade accountant that uses mm. all these big words that he doesn't understand so mm. Mm. i've mm. always made a point of using not even just plain english but simple language that people understand they don't yeah they don't want to hear me talking about frs 102 they they don't care no. that's not what they want from me no. uh, so we have yeah and that's that's when our our brand our identity slowly started to change mm. um over the next mm. few years and then in actual fact, we went we went a bit too far with it, um, and this is where it gets a bit crazy. You know, we we started we started swearing a lot in, in a lot of our marketing, um, and we start referring to ourselves as the cool the cool accountant. And you know, our office we had uh, PlayStation Xbox in there. We had posters all over the wall. It looked like a boy's bedroom. Thinking back now, it was it's bloody embarrassing. Um, <laughs> at the time we, we we got all excited about it we thought you know this is what people want let's let's go out and do it yeah um so we yeah we just went a bit crazy with it and our, our marketing it was it was it was it was to the point where i think it was um yeah you know especially other accountants they'd look at it we put a lot of people off that was kind of the point we kind of thought well if you don't like the way we're talking the way we're yes. doing things if you want a traditional accounting, go and find one, but that's not us. That's right. But, you know, there was, there was, there was a lot of comments made about us, especially within the industry, other, other accountants. Yes. Um, yes. You know, we got called. There's, there's a post about us in some accounting forums where they've said, have you seen this firm on the South Coast? And yeah. they say things like, what a bunch of clowns, or they look like they don't, they're not old enough to have left school. Um, they're clearly unqualified. I can't imagine they get any clients doing this, but we were, we were picking up a lot of new clients. Yeah. Uh, more because of the model and the way we were doing things, I think, rather than the way we were behaving. And it's at that point, someone gave me what I probably consider the best advice I've ever had. And they said, you know, you're, you're at a 10 out of 10 and you can scale it back to eight out of 10 and have a much better effect. And that's, that's what we did. Uh, we, we took that on board and we decided, you know, we need to stop going so far with it. Let, let's scale it back a bit. You know, one of the problem, one of the errors we were making was if you say you're cool, you're, you're not cool. You know, you just sound like a dad who's just purchased a new pair of slippers. Oh, son, look how cool these are. You know, that immediately makes them not cool. Um, you know, forgetting the fact that they're slippers. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and that's that's when we started to have a, a rebrand as well. And I decided, you know, it needs to stop being about me. This is this is becoming bigger than me now. Um, and that's when we re- rebranded to Diverso, which got you took a while to come up with. But we basically came up with our, our brand values. So what makes us different? Yeah. And uh, I, I started to put that in Google Translate. And different is that as uh, uh, diverse is Italian for different, so that's, right. that's where the name comes from. Brilliant. And then it was it was about that time where I started to grow up a bit as well, because mm. the the early days between the ages of twenty one and sort of twenty five, twenty six, you know, it, it was very much oh, I'm a business owner. Here's my business card. Look look how cool and important I am. Mm. And I was a bit I was a bit immature with it. Um, I I definitely needed to grow up both as a as a professional, um, and I, I think a man as well. Do you know um, what happens when you turn 25, 26? What? 
because you you just specifically mentioned that year those years yeah, oh, oh i do i do yeah yeah when i was when i was 25 26 i met my partner becky and right after a year i had my son um also called sean and that that's what changed things that's that's i think that's what made me grow up and, and change and there is something else that happens after. too um physically yeah. <clears throat> in your brain and that is the frontal lobe is fully developed by the age of 25 26. maybe that was it and the frontal lobe is called the executive mm -hmm. right that's its nickname that's where you make all your decision decisions yeah and um, where you you have the ability to better reflect on excuse me one sec <clears throat> yeah you have the opportunity to reflect better on what's going on in your life mm. and make better decisions yeah. so and obviously if you met your partner and got married and then you know had a child in that period as well that will help you know, mm. in terms of your decision making as well. So yeah, awesome. Brilliant. Yeah. And then it was from that point where, yeah, we really started to focus and get a bit more strategic with it. And that's, that's how we slowly develop the model that we've got sort of today. Um, so tell yeah. us more about the model then. So the model, yeah, what, what we actually do. Um, we're so first of all, we're a subscription. So we're a monthly subscription. So we like to say we're sort of like Netflix, although I think legally we're not allowed, you know, we're not allowed to use that in our marketing because Netflix will sue us. Yeah. Uh, but uh, that's, that's how we work. You know, we're, we're 99 pound a month all in. So mm. it's something that we've come up with what we think is ideal for the micro businesses that get ignored or ripped off by, by, uh, by other people. Uh, mm. by other, and this isn't just true of accountancy either. It's lots of service providers. They always want the bigger businesses. They don't, they don't want the smaller ones yes so we we come up with a, a package that that works for them so it's just it's 99 pound a month 99 pound a month all in um you get some good software so you get zero receipt bank and fluidly which helps you um run your business more effectively all your year-end accounts and returns anything to do with registrations or submitting anything to company's house or hmrc it's it's all included we're very much a, a partner in in a small business and I think one of the most important things you get with that as well is unlimited advice and support. Um, we tend to make this joke with a with new clients that you can phone, call, email us every day if you want to, um, or even come and meet us every day and we still won't charge you anymore. And that that is literally the case. It doesn't matter how much they talk to us, how much advice they get. It's it's all included. It's just nine time pound a month. That's it. Mm, mm. And, and that's that's invaluable. That's what they want. Um, so with that, we give certain guarantees, like a guaranteed response within 24 hours. Again, mm -hmm. we don't want to be waiting three months for, for an answer on something. Yeah. Um, and yeah, just it, that's what works really well. But the only, the only way we're able to do that is um, by being very specific with the type of client that we deal with. Yes. So we've got a rule of thumb that we don't, and this, this can vary depending on what the business actually does. But as a rule of thumb, we don't take on any any business that's got more than 10 employees or more than 500,000 pound a year turnover. Right. That gives an indication on size. Yes. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter what the business does or what industry they're in because mm. what they need from us is exactly the same every single time. And the way yeah. we've got the model to work is again, we're quite specific with how things work. We don't like variation. So every single, we, we give free zero, which is account software. Yes. With, with all of our with, with with our package so every single client we've got is on zero wow i mean quite secretively in the background that means in terms of our internal processes and systems you know the more our business model how it works it's really streamlined and process driven yes so every time we have, we approach a, a client's year and we do the exact same things every single time and we're all only working on zero so it's pretty much exactly the same every time and that's what allows us to Basically, it's a volume-based model, really. You know, we mm -hmm. don't make tons and tons of profit for, from each client. No. But we make just about enough that it's, it's volume-based. And I think that's, that's the key. That's what, that's what makes it work. But and we're volume-based without sort of our clients being a number because we've got a decent model with 
how our staff work as well. Yes. Especially we have, and this is this is how we're really starting to grow now. Is that in terms of our internal uh, organizational chart, if you like, um, we've got a practice manager. They oversee everything and the workflow and make sure that it all works smoothly. And then we've got an accounts team, and they do the accounts and tax returns and bookkeeping and actual yes. actual work. And then yes. we've got client partners. And the yes. other starts with the client partners because their a client partner's job is basically to win and keep clients. That's mm. their only job. So they're the they're the only point of contact that a client has. Mm. Because I know the relationship that you have between client and accountant. That's the most important thing. And what bugs clients sometimes is if they get knocked around between different people within a firm. You know, yes. One day, one day your accountant is Sean, then it's Jay, then it's Sam, then it's Sonia. And the client's thinking, you know, I don't know who the bloody hell to talk to. You know, my, my right. firm is diverse, mm-hmm. but we've no idea who it is. So we make sure that we keep that personal relationship. Right. So in terms of growing now and how we're going to scale, it's just find a client partner, put them wherever we want in the UK. And yeah. then we've got a marketing sort of program behind that, how we win clients. Because we, we don't really have any issue winning new clients at all. It's, it just happens now with certain right. things that we've got in place. Um, and it then evolves around the client partner and we add other team members in as, as that starts to grow. And is there, for you guys, you may not wish to answer this publicly, and that's fine, but there must be a um, kind of break-even point that you really need X number of clients paying the £99 a month in order for you guys to get paid every month a decent wage and make uh, a little bit yeah but i mean we're we're sort of well over that great you know that all of this was ever since i first started it was always about monthly fees for me i never called it a monthly subscription no i didn't know what one was um but that's 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 what i've always given i basically whenever we took on a new client even when it was just me i'd agree a monthly fee and then i'd do everything for that i've never yeah. I just I didn't feel comfortable charging clients more, um, and it was it took me a while to realise actually we we're giving a monthly subscription, so it's it's uh, the, the the way it breaks down if you like that ninety nine pounds, I'm, I'm more than happy to to be open and honest about how all this works. I, I tell people all the time, so I'm quite proud of it. Um, yes. So that ninety nine pounds, we've got there's about thirty pound that goes to zero to pay the zero fee. Yeah. And then there's the client partner gets a bonus. So right. our client partners, they get a salary of a thousand pounds and they get a twenty percent bonus for whatever the client pays. So yeah. twenty pounds goes to the client partner. Right. And that's that's what helps them sort of build their own portfolio of clients and they're paid directly for the work they do. Yes. But that's what makes it work. If they want to earn more, they go out and get new clients. Yes. We win because we earn more and then they win because they earn more. Yes. But that's half the client fee gone already that's and right has, and then that other 50 pounds the other 50 percent um of that fee it goes towards paying for the office the salaries of uh all the other members of the team um so the practice manager the, the accounts team um and everything else becomes that comes with running a business yeah and that's that's how it works but that 50 pounds yeah that's been covered ages ago that was covered um you know obviously i had my client base that i built and then we introduced another client partner and then another one so all costs are covered and that's what i mean in terms of scaling yes how it starts with the client partner so yes like manchester you know we're not in manchester i don't think we've got a single client in manchester we might have one or two but if i found a client partner in manchester mm. um you know as a firm we we can spare a thousand pound profit to start paying their salary straight away right so they're based in Manchester, and then as it starts to grow, they'll get ten new clients. They've covered their salary. That's fine. We're breaking. We're you know we're we're covered because yeah. all the office and staff and stuff. There's enough capacity that they can deal with a few new clients. Yes. But then once that client partner's got to say thirty, forty, or maybe fifty clients, that's when we'll say right, we're making a lot more profit from that now. Let's take on um, a new accounts t- a, a new accounts team member. Or yes. Let's take on you know a new admin member or something like that so it's cash flow is easy because it's a it's a, a monthly subscription so there's certain points certain trigger points that say right we, we need something new now 
Got it. Got it. So, so the, here's a term for you. You, you may have heard this. Um, I listen to some American podcasts, and this model, obviously, that you're describing, is it's like the golden egg model almost. You know, if any business, even my business, if any business could have what they're calling a recurring revenue bundle or short rundle, <laughs> it's like an Americanism rundle, recurring revenue bundle, um, then that gives people the ability to sleep at night because they know they're getting paid every month, you know, by their group of clients that they have. And that's a very attractive model, not just obviously to you as an organization, but also to the client. Um, because it means their cost is spread over the year and the peaks and troughs are kind of smooth out. Mm. I mean, I did a project for a company that does load balances. You probably have no idea what that is, but it's something to help. You know, when you got Black Friday sales and everybody goes onto a website and it crashes, mm like Debenhams did yesterday because everybody wanted to go and buy stuff from them. But it's because you haven't got enough servers to deal with the traffic. Well, a load balancer deals with that traffic peaks and troughs. And I did, I did a project, an animation project for a client where they were having a, like a monthly rep, you know, subscription model. Yeah. And regardless of the peaks and troughs, you'll get, if you need a lot of traffic, Kind of next month you'll get it. If you need less, the following month you'll get it. You know, and it, and all they need to pay is a is a monthly subscription, and mm. that is so attractive to so many companies out there because, you know, income. If they haven't got a recurring revenue bundle themselves or subscription model with their clients, it's got it's just peaks and troughs all the time. Yeah, I mean, Michael, I'm a massive fan of recurring income. I go mm. on about it all. I I consider myself an expert. I've, mm. I've put out on LinkedIn before. If you want to chat to me about how you can get recurring income in your business, I'll do it for free. Here's my calendar link. And I've spoken to a couple of people because I, I genuinely believe almost every business out there can have recurring income yes. somehow. Yeah. You've just got to be creative. And if I if I tell you a quick story about a website client that I had, yes, that I have, um, he wanted me to help him with his cash flow. So he, he came on board as a, as a client. He said, you know, I'm, I really struggled with cash flow, like when I have to pay tax, saving up for it, all those things cause, cause a problem. So he yes. had the, the traditional model that still a lot of website providers do now, um, where they say, all right, it's, you know, five grand for your website. You pay me 50% upfront, 50% when it goes live, something like that. So that's, that's, what, that's, that's the model that he had. So what we were working on was, okay, your, your flat rate VAT, so any amount that comes in the bank in terms of sales, we're going to put across 12% into a VAT savings account. That's how we're going to save for your VAT. Corporation tax, we're going to estimate what your tax bill is going to be at the end of the year. And I think we worked out something like 10%. So yeah. any, even if £100 comes into his bank account, there was uh, 22% that immediately went out into two separate savings accounts. So yes. they'd never be caught short on the tax bill again. Yeah. But what kept happening was he'd go out, he'd have to go out and find work all the time. So he'd always need to be on the hunt for new business. Yes. So he'd go out and, you know, he'd pick up a couple of website clients for that month and he'd be fine. We'd transfer the money into the savings account. That's, that's great. But the next month, he wouldn't get any new clients. He'd struggle to, to, to find some. Mm -hmm. Or he's working on a project um, and he's not going to get paid for it until next month when it, when it goes live. Yes. And all of his, salary and stuff would come out you know he needs to earn a certain amount each month to pay for his mortgage food and all his personal stuff yes and he'd have he wouldn't have enough money in the bank so we take the money out of savings yes and this was a repeating pattern that kept happening and it's kind of i got to the point where i said tom what's the point in doing this you know this is i can't think of any other way that we can manage this because what's happening is you get to a certain you, you will get to a month and you won't have any new work come in so we undo all the hard work we've done with the savings and then it comes up to paying your tax bill and you haven't got enough. You know, and the answer could be, oh, we need more work in. 
we need to go get more work, we need to get better at marketing, but then where's the money for marketing? This is when I suggested to him instead, you know, from a customer's point of view, most small businesses don't have five grand to pay for a website. No. But, and I know it sounds like you're taking a risk here, but how about if you approached it this way? If you said rather than five grand, you pay me, let's say, hundred pound a month for a website. Mm -hmm. So you pay me a hundred pounds a month, I build your website, but then any changes you want to that website are all included. Yes. So for the first, so in, in effect, sort of labor wise, he would be down on money. And it took yeah. me six months to convince him to actually go with it. Um, so instead of, yeah, I'll build you a website, 5,000 pounds, thanks very much. It's, yeah, I'll build you a website, 100 pounds a month, thank you very much. 100 pounds a month every month. The clients loved it. You know, he, he got so many new clients because it was a different model. They didn't have to come up with a big, chunky uh, wad of cash to buy the website. And the point being is after, if you think about 5,000 pounds, after, say, five years, that client could be losing money because if they just pay five grand in the first place, they wouldn't have to pay anything. You know, they, they'd have hit that point. But the point being after five years, mm -hmm. it's a radically different website because it includes free updates. Because you pay five grand for a website and then you want, you know, a, a blog feature added or something. It's frustrating to go back to the guy that made your website. And then he says, yeah, I can do that, but it's going to cost you another 200 quid or 500 pounds. All that's included. So you can make as many changes to your website as you want. Yeah, so yeah. clients are happier and he's happier because he starts to build his cash flow. So he started to transfer a lot of his existing clients over to this new model. Yes. So he started to build his income. Anyway, it, it, it got to like 500 and 1,000, then 2,000. And then he was, and then he covered his salary. Mm -hmm. uh, it was about two and a half grand a month or something he wanted. He was still mm -hmm. doing a couple of one-off jobs because he wasn't prepared to completely get rid of them. So mm -hmm. clients were coming to him and he was saying, well, you can do this for £99 a month or I can charge you five grand. And some would still go for the five grand option. Yes. Um, but most went for the for the £100 a month or, or whatever it was. And now, coming up to COVID, um, when all that kicked off, he, like a lot of website designers, he would have been screwed. You know, not a lot of many people want to spend a big, chunky cash, uh, amount of cash right now mm. on a new website. Mm. Um, but when it comes to a small outgoing each month to keep their website there, because if they stop paying, they lose the website. It's, it's a, a subscription, basically. Um, and so paying that fee is easy. So he was absolutely protected yeah. by what yeah. happened. You know, I didn't say to him, hey, if there's ever a global pandemic, you're going to be protected. It wasn't, no, no. Who can say that? But it was about not having the fear of having to go out and get more work. It's easy. Yeah. Flow for him is easy. And now there's, he's never got a problem with his tax bill. You know, we can pinpoint it to within ten pounds, pretty much, as we're going along throughout the year, because we know how much money he's got coming in and out, and it's everything is so much easier. Uh, yeah, brilliant. That's absolutely genius, mm. and and I, I love that idea, and that's something definitely. And well, for my business, it's it's a big priority to get that revenue, you know, recurring revenue, going mm. model going, and I think. A lot of small businesses who will be listening or watching this, that's exactly the same for them too. So um, I mean, if you're I, listening, I, please contact Sean. He can give you some advice. <laughs> absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to chat to anyone for free because you know, I want to test my skills in it as well. You know, I've, yes. I've helped even businesses that you think would never be able to get recurring income. Mm. Um, I mean, I helped bar, a barber shop come up with an idea. Although they've kind of got recurring income anyway, Mm. With them, I just help them solidify their customers as clients. So rather yes. than just hope they come back six six weeks later or whatever, or whatever yeah. we create a way like a VIP membership to solidify that. And the same with a a, a beauty shop, uh, mm. beauty therapist. You know, they they well, they were getting a lot of customers that were just coming for a one off or a treat or whatever. And we created a way again with like a VIP membership that we could get recurring income from them. Yes, uh, and encourage them to to keep coming back. I think that's the key is turning people from customers to clients. Now, I would define that as a customer as a one-off and you're not necessarily going to see them again, but a client is an ongoing relationship. Oh, I like that. that. I like that. Yeah. And that's another thing that recurring income helps build. It forces you to deliver value because if yeah. we take the case of the website guy, if he's not responsive, he doesn't update websites quick enough or mm. you know, the, the clients will leave and go somewhere else. 
But the same yeah. with, and it's exactly the same with Netflix. If for whatever reason you go into Netflix and it's not working or there's no films on there, mm. you're going to leave and go and subscribe to a, a different like Prime or something like that. Mm. It yeah. forces you to deliver value and be an awesome business. Yeah. Sean, we, we could talk for hours on this topic. <laughs> Fascinating. So how can people find out more about your business and connect with you? So find out more about the business at uh, wearediverso.com. Okay. Or if you want to find out more about me, I'm most active on LinkedIn. So connect with me there. Sean Toomer, spelled S-E-A-N. It's a very rare name. I think I'm mm. one of only like three people that have that name. Yes. Um, so if you get lost, just Google it and you'll, you'll find me. Brilliant. OK. Um, I, and I'll make sure those are in the show notes as well so people can click through on that. Fantastic. Thank you very much for spending the time talking about your story, but more importantly, your business model. And um, I, I think it's fantastic. I love the fact that you are disrupting the accountancy um, landscape. Very much needed. There's a lot of um, interesting stuff that goes on in accountancy firms, especially the very large ones in the world uh, that are have, aren't always that great, I have to say. Uh, we've heard many stories about them over the years, for sure. And uh, I hope your model catches on for a lot of micro stroke small businesses and they see the benefit of that because it's, it's desperately needed, that's for sure. And hopefully we'll meet once all this is over and you're ever in the Midlands, let me know. Um, if you're traveling up to Manchester, stop off in kind of Birmingham, Midlands, Worcestershire way. And uh, I buy you lunch or a coffee, whatever you prefer. <laughs> oh, that sounds great. Will do. <laughs> all right. Me. Thanks for being on the podcast. I'll speak to you soon. Take Bye. care. Yes. See ya. Bye. 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 If you've enjoyed this podcast, please rate, subscribe, and share at will. I'm always looking for more listeners and guests, so do get in touch, please. You can find me pretty easily by searching for Staying Alive UK. Thank you. Staying Alive UK. Share your story.